I um, got this farm, uh, I don't know, three years ago. And uh, it had, it's dry land, it's uh, on part of a subdivision, they were supposed to extend the, the roads out and sell more lots, and they haven't done that yet. But, uh, so I've just been, uh, it's been farmed for about 30 years in this position, the way it is. And the farmer the last 18 years before me, basically all he did was uh, put in sorghum. He probably, uh, well, he'd spray it with Roundup. He'd plant the sorghum. Then he'd spray it again, put a little fertilizer on, and then they'd harvest it. So 18 years monocropping, the same thing over and over and over. And it's all on a river bottom. Uh, a lot of it uh, uh, was under the flood of 2013. So there's a whole lot of sand, silt deposits, and it's a mess. And I just started uh, doing the soil sampling with it uh, this last year. And organic matter started out at 1.9, which really surprised me. As much as it's been beat up over the years, I didn't think that it would even be that high. So let's, let's go ahead. Um, two years ago, we had a whole bunch of rain, if everybody remembers. I mean, like, zero. Mm -hmm. And I mm. went, uh, went over to the field one day to take a look at it and see what was going on in the spring. And we had this cute little aqua carpet. I stole this picture. It's not too many people want to go out and take pictures of kosher that's a solid carpet. But that's exactly what I had. So yeah, Houston, we've got a problem. Now, it hadn't rained. Soil was tough. I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, well, uh, the forecast doesn't look very good. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to let it grow. Um, use that as my cover crop. And we'll pasture it. We'll try and hay it. We'll do whatever we can to try and get anything off of it. So primary succession is soil builds. Uh, we start with bare rock. It eventually moves to lichens. You get to the small annual plants. And as time progresses, then you get into the more shade tolerant. Uh, as you see, the soil builds deeper and deeper and deeper. When we have a secondary succession, which a lot of us are familiar with in the area here, where we have a fire. A lot of the same thing happens when you have a lack of moisture. You don't have your mineral cycle, you don't have your water cycle. And so what happens is that soil gets built and you cut those cycles off, it goes backwards. So you start losing your organic matter, your biomass, and all of your uh, uh, all your uh, little creatures in the soil, they, they just quit functioning. And basically what happens is the bacteria just take over, there's no fungus, and you just start reverting back to where the soil started from. It'll get hard, it'll get porous, it cracks, and so, so what we come up with with uh, non-mycorrhizal plants You'll get the pigweed, the lamb's quarters, brassicas, kochia, lupine, and sedges. When you have very high levels of bacteria, where the bacteria have taken over, there's no fungi, you're going to get the lamb's quarters, the nettles, the thistle, and the kochia. This is how the ground is reacting, and these are the plants that come available. The seeds are always there, but these are the plants that come available to try and help protect the soil. <laughs> Um, I was at the no-till conference here in Burlington a week ago, and one of the analogies that they shared with us, uh, you've been in a room, you've been someplace, and you can feel someone looking at you. You're not looking at them, but you can feel them looking at you. Uh, basically what that means is that plants communicate the same way. You can feel those eyes on you. Plants will send out messages through their roots. Well, the kochia is what came and bailed out that, that farm that year. It protected it. Obviously, it wasn't a cash crop. I was able to harvest a little bit and pasture some of it, and it's not what I wanted by any means. And unfortunately, it's along 287, so 
nobody saw it. But uh, <laughs> next one, please. <clears throat> so what happens when we when we cut those cycles off is we lose all this microbiological activity. That soil compacts, it gets hot, you get a lot more sun degrading it, and the fungi go away, and so we lose all those cycles and we lose all those all those creatures in there. Um, not sure. Can anybody tell me how many uh, how many microorganisms are in a cubic foot of soil? Does anybody know? Billions. Billions. It's about the same population as the world, about eight billion in one cubic foot. So when we lose those cycles, that water cycle, that mineral cycle, we start losing all that activity. All right, that's kind of small, so I'll just read it through. When we lose the water cycle, the soil warms, the microbiological activity diminishes, mineralization cycle ceases, nitrogen no longer can be fixed by the plants, the soil pH starts increasing, photosynthesis is reduced, plants don't grow, they protect themselves. They start sending out all those messages to other plants to try and protect themselves and try and get all those microorganisms to come and help them. Well, when it gets to the point where everything shuts down, we start losing all that, and so it becomes a very vicious circle and it just starts eating on itself. All right, carbon no longer enters the soil. The sun penetrates it. Everything just kind of dissipates, and we start moving back in the succession line. All the nutrients become toxic or out of balance. Soil biology reverts itself back. Uh, the soil organisms, organisms begin to riot. Only the fittest survive. So you'll start losing all your worms, uh, your centipedes, all the larger, uh, all the larger microorganisms, and then what you end up getting is the bacteria will just take over. So lots of times, if you plow a field and you smell that that oh that earthy smell, that's actually a lot more bacteria, and it's not a balance of of the fungi. So our, again, our soil succession starts declining, the particles begin to fuse, bacteria become too abundant, secondary biomes die off, protozoa, worms, nematodes all diminish, only the weeds of excess can exist. All right, so there we are the spring of 22, and we've got that high density kochia, that lovely aqua color, yuck, I don't even want to look at it. So this spring, I went in there and I had all kinds of hopes and dreams and let's, you know, the eternal life of a farmer next year will be better. Well, I planted cover crops in there. I planted uh, seven or eight different species, uh, brassicas, uh, there were radishes, um, turnips, hairy vetch, triticale, oats, and I, I guess that was it. And as you can see, they all started germinating there. But what you don't see, and there'll be a close-up here in a bit, what you don't see is a whole lot of weeds. There's only a couple of weeds here and there. You would think that the kochia being as thick as it was the year before, that they would all be there. Here's a close-up, and as we see, there's a couple of red root here, a red root there. Um, there's a red root here. I looked at this very, very closely. And I just took the picture, and it wasn't until Elizabeth asked me to send in pictures that I blew this thing all up and started looking at it. There is one kochia in that picture, and there's only six red root. Nothing else. But the thing that annoyed me that I didn't know anything about is right up here, a whole bunch of aphids. And as the crop grew, and you'll see the pictures later, all the brassica disappeared, and the aphids went and eliminated them. So a few weeks later, this is what the field looks like. You can see that it's not heavily populated. I, don't, I think I only planted about 20, 25 pounds. Hey, I didn't know if it was going to rain. I didn't know what we were going to get, so it didn't want to go really heavy on it. But you look really closely, there's very few radishes and turnips in there. But there is some hairy vetch, the, um, the triticale, and the oats are in there. Next. 
And then as the spring came on, the hairy bench started, started blooming. You can see that the ground is just almost covered all the way through. And I cut this um, normally, of course, with a cover crop. What you want to try and do is to terminate it, not necessarily cut it. But what I was doing was I was planting buckwheat in there. So I took that off as quick as I could so I could get the buckwheat planted. And that's another picture in there. You can see uh, the diversity in there, but there are no turnips and there are no radishes. And off of uh, 18 acres, uh, that's the cover crop that I harvested off of there. Now, I planted sorghum because, well, it's always had sorghum. Why not? Um, but I needed some more feed. Um, the year before, we had run really, really short with the cattle. I was having to buy bottoms of stacks and everything else. So I just wanted some extra feed. So I planted 15 acres of sorghum on that. And that is the sorghum uh, shortly after I planted the buckwheat, which would have been uh, August 2nd, August 3rd. As you can see, it's almost as tall as the, the cab on the tractor. And then this is where I planted the buckwheat. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have a no-till drill, so I just planted that with my old drill. And you can see there's not a lot of germination in here, but the buckwheat did come up pretty well. Uh, the one problem that I had with the buckwheat, it was an experiment. I didn't know if we could double crop. Um, the freeze did catch it before it got fully developed, but it still made enough to combine. You can see here the rows, uh, how it had germinated. Uh, we had a huge storm on August 1st. And I was able to go into that field, it's really sandy. I went in there, I believe it was August 4th, and planted. And this picture would have been about August 10th. And then this is towards uh, the first part of September. You can see that the buckwheat isn't very tall in a lot of spaces. Uh, germination wasn't very good, but it was starting to pollinate over there. And you really don't want to walk into a buckwheat field at that level because the honeybees are so thick, it, the ground just moves. And then that's uh, the field of the sorghum that I harvested. I did leave, uh, it's really, really rocky up there towards you, when you get towards those houses, so I left that up there uh, for pasture, and then I, uh, I pastured that, I mob grazed that, and uh, they had a full run of the field eventually, but what I did was I cordoned it off, uh, made paddocks with electric fence, and they would, they would get about an acre or two of the sorghum. And instead of being able to, I figured it would probably last a month if I were to pasture the whole thing, I was able to get about two and a half months of pasture out of that by putting the paddocks in. And you can see that uh, and stuff had, had fallen, there's already been snow. I think this was, uh, this was towards the end of November I took this picture. And they had been in there, and you could see how closely that they had knocked it down. They didn't eat it completely flat. Um, but you can't quite see in this picture, but the manure is almost thick enough that I could almost take a loader in there and load it out. They had spent that much time in there. And this part of the field, like I said, is really rocky. It's had a lot of, a lot of earth moved on it, and it's. I won't soil sample this. That's I guess that's, that's it. it. Okay. All right. Questions? Any questions? Uh oh. What, what you, you got? got? to grow buckwheat and a lot of the buckwheat that I sell ends up in Japan. I'm kind of confused. Uh, you got the sorghum in there, you cut it, bail it, and then plant buckwheat in that field? No, uh, just in the cover crop is where I planted the buckwheat. I left the sorghum. Okay. Sorry. 
Well, I, and, and as it turns out, I wish I had sampled the hay. I guess I still could. That, that cover crop. I mean, those cows were fat, and they would bypass alfalfa to get to the cover crop. They wanted that far more than they did uh, the alfalfa bales. So, so what, what about the kosher? What about the kosher? Any kosher now? No. Yeah. No. But there's next year. <laughs> <laughs>